So we'll get into the live demonstration. We'll have a look at uh, some of these things I've talked about. Okay, so important thing to know, I guess Windchill Risk and Reliability can be deployed as just a client, so standalone, um, no interaction. You can also be um, interacting with Windchill or connected to Windchill. Um, and I'll show you how those differ um, in my example. So here is basically the client install. I've got a standalone project. Um, when we create these projects, we essentially can choose whether or not we want to use um, inbuilt wizards to define things like um, the reusing existing projects. So I might have uh, a series of projects that I use as a template. I could also reference standard or sample projects that are built right into the software. And these help us define certain standards um, or templates that we want to use. So depending on the industry, you might be um, creating uh, certain forms, certain documentation based on a specific standard. Um, and then risk and reliability will allow you to achieve that um, straight out of the box. And then if it's something that you're interested in that isn't there, then we can definitely customize it to suit your needs. Okay, so I've already created one of these projects and I'll just open it up. So the important thing to note is uh, depending on the modules you have available to you, uh, in terms of your licensing, you'll have a different view of available modules. So it's simply a matter of selecting it in order to toggle them on and off, um, but that's something to keep in mind. So to use prediction, we effectively take um, our system tree. So this system tree can be generated uh, within your risk and reliability project itself. It can also be pulled through from Windchill. So this is just a standalone, so I can add and remove components um, simply by right-clicking, so you have a bunch of context-sensitive menus. And we can look at things like our calculation data and calculation model. So over here, we can see, simply using the available dropdowns, we can easily switch between them. You'll notice that all the fields automatically update, meaning that you can easily see which fields you need to populate with data in order to achieve or satisfy that calculation model. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll add a part and we'll populate some of this data. Okay, so I'm adding in a logic board to my example, and this will be printed circuit board. Cool. So we can easily input that information uh, into our system. And if we jump back, we now start defining uh, additional attributes or parameters for our calculation. So the idea here is that we can perform uh, individual checks. So we don't have to necessarily conduct or run a full, full calculation on our entire bomb structure. We can easily go in, uh, maybe pick out a few components and check easily uh, what sort of failure rate we should be expecting. Uh, so this is handy as a form of like a sanity check just to make sure you're on the right track. And as you can imagine, we can easily change this to generate a different value. So the idea here is that we can populate this information and once we're happy with that information, we can go ahead and calculate it. So it's just a matter of clicking the calculate and then running through our appropriate module. And then from there, we get a nice summary as well as that information getting populated in our columns. Okay, so in scenarios like this, you might have uh, a lot of information there. So risk and reliability has a variety of different filters. So we can see here, we can filter out um, all the individual parts that are represented in our bomb. We can also define custom filters uh, for our entire system tree. So to create one, you can simply go through, define the, the acceptable field. You can see there's a variety of different options, so really depending um, on what you're interested in. We can also save these filters for reuse later on. 
And just like that, we can filter out that data. So in this example, which is pretty small, um, we're not too worried, but you can imagine that uh, in scenarios where you have a large data set, you might want to, I guess, make use of these filters to easily uh, go through and filter out your data. Okay. So the next thing I'll go and talk about is uh, the FMEA. So FMEAs work on um, different sort of, um, I guess, worksheets themselves. So like I mentioned, we have um, functional process components. So depending on the type um, or the system that you're actually interested in. For my example, I'll be using the component. So a component is essentially taking or duplicating the system tree. So um, if I add new components to that, it'll come, it'll get pulled across into my FMEA worksheet. Let's readjust this. So the benefits of using the FMEA is the ability to easily restructure your uh, worksheet. So you can imagine in Excel, if we want to add in new rows and columns, we'll be copying and pasting data, uh, merging cells and so forth. Within FMEA, we have the ability to add new failure modes, um, local effects, end effects, as well as new items um, easily without uh, little to no effort. So basically clicking on the corresponding icon, we can add new lines depending on uh, where we need them and depending on the template that you're using. Okay, so I'll just remove some of these. Um, the other thing to note is the ability to use list libraries. So what do I mean by that? So if I start typing, we can see that information has been pre-populated based on uh, previously inputted data. So this data could have been generated by the, I guess the project manager, he's gone in and defined a various failure modes, or this could be inputted on the fly. So if I add that in, we can see that it's essentially pulling through items from my list library. If I add a new value, it's gonna add, it's gonna ask me basically, do you wanna add this um, to your library? So now if I click the drop down, um, I can see that information there. So this makes it um, a good way of standardizing um, and reusing existing information. Um, because a lot of the times you might have information or combinations of information that are pre-existing that have already been defined. Um, why not leverage that and speed up the process and reduce any sort of uh, discrepancies in your data? The other thing to note is the fault equivalence file. So you'll go. Yeah, and what I'm basically doing is I'm pre-populating some of this data. Okay, so. You line, okay. I can spell properly. And right then and there, when I enter that last end effect, you can see that the severity, the occurrence, and the detection have automatically been populated. And what happens here is that um, I've defined uh, within the system files that if I enter a certain combination um, of data as a failure mode, local effect, and end effect, automatically populate the severity, occurrence, and detection. So you can have any sort of combination depending on uh, firstly, the columns you have available to you, but it just allows you to um, speed up that data entry process based on information that you've already populated uh, in the system. So you can essentially go through, um, generate these data by, or generate data for your fault equivalence file. You can also refresh that data as it changes and matures over time. Okay, so the FMEA also has um, tool tips so you can add uh, tooltips to any column to make sure that people understand exactly what they're looking at. Um, you might have new users that are onboarding, um, they're not too sure on their correct process. Um, so you can define different levels, what does a seven mean, what does 10 mean, um, and so on, um, to allow them to better understand or better populate that data. We can also add notes to your um, system. So 
if I have specific fields, I can add notes. So you can imagine I can go through my worksheet um, populated with a bunch of information um, and then users can go in, check if that information is correct or um, appropriate and tick that off. So you can go through, kind of validate that in terms of um, end users and maybe a project manager that's going through and reviewing those people's um, data. So from this, we can take it and we can perform um, graphing sort of capabilities. So go in, use the out-of-the-box templates and produce a resulting risk matrix. So you can see depending on uh, the inputs in terms of severity occurrence and the resulting values, I have um, a few different um, items located in my cells. So I can click on them to highlight those examples um, and I can then generate that out uh, if need be. Okay, and likewise, we have the ability to use inbuilt reporting. Um, so if I'm interested in just reporting out the standard worksheet, then I can go through and generate that data. Okay. Okay, so the next thing we'll look at is um, the RBD table, so um, or reality reliability block diagrams, should I say. So the idea here is that we've generated a bunch of individual diagrams, um, whether it's in this case, the tablet PC or the individual hard disk. Um, so we can easily switch between them if need be, or we can go through and we can link out to different diagrams. So you can see here, we have a linked hard disk assembly. Click on that plus sign will take us there. Um, so you can imagine really complex systems. Each one of these blocks could be linked to another diagram. And then from there, they could be linked to another diagram. And I've seen that happen. So you get a very complex structure, but you're able to easily navigate uh, and follow that path from start to finish. You also have the ability to use data linking. So data linking is defined by these blue icons here. If I go data linking and link that data, we can see all the available sources and where we're pulling that information from. Um, so in this example, this motherboard is essentially pulling in uh, that prediction data directly into my RBD to then reuse for my calculations. So I'm not manually going in and populating that failure data. I'm not adding that information. It's all getting pulled from the source content. So I can change it once and have it propagate all the way through my project. Okay. So as shown here, so we have a variety of different calculation properties uh, that we can include, uh, whether we're looking at the failure, um, redundancy, so standby parallel operating, um, corrective maintenance. So we can define things like a repair resource um, where we have maybe a preferred supplier, they have um, a standard call out fee, um, any cost associated with that. We can start inputting that data into our RBD to then calculate the appropriate cost associated with it, um, minimize those costs through optimization and so on. We also have uh, when certain blocks are replaced. So you can imagine a motherboard, um, if it does fail, is it gonna be repaired, is it gonna be discarded um, and so forth. We can look at maintenance tasks um, as well as spares. So, you know, repositories where uh, we're actually storing this um, stockpile of goods. You know, can we optimize that site quantity, um, off-site quantity? You know, how much does it cost to store it? Things of that nature. Okay. We can also change those visual properties. So, like we saw in this example, we have everything easily identified. So we're not having to look through just the text alone. We can navigate to the picture um, and understand that this is the hard drive, battery, um, RAM, and so forth. So I can easily change that. And just like that, I can sort of update, uh, make it very easy to understand and follow for new users. So um, it's very quick and easy and just all out of the box. We can also look at things like a mission or phase diagram. So where we're looking at um, operating time, depending on certain scenarios, um, dependent on a mission profile. So this is where we're looking, um, taking a step further, taking our 
existing uh, IBD diagram. So you can see that phase one is linked to my initial tablet PC. And then from that, we can define based on uh, specific durations where it occurs and understand the stresses on the system. Okay, so to create block diagrams, simply a matter of you know, creating a new block uh, or initial page. And then from there, we can go in, add our blocks, connect them up, and then from there, start defining uh, additional uh, properties and attributes. So from there, let's go ahead and do some data linking. So we can easily update that information. You can see all that information get propagated across. So we're not manually filling it in. Uh, and we have that visual indication of um, that being linked. Okay. The other thing we can do is we can start entering our redundancies. So if we have, uh, in this case, a battery, and then we want to have it as standby, so when one unit fails, uh, the next one steps in, we can simulate those sort of scenarios. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve out of this system, um, but you can see it's all, all there, ready to go. Um, very easy to kind of go in uh, and input that information. Okay. So the next thing we'll look at is uh, FTA diagrams. So the idea here is that we are creating similar diagrams, um, similar panels to what RBD has, uh, but we're interested in this top level uh, gate or event that's going to occur. So all the events leading up to it, um, and then which ones are, I guess, most dominant um, in terms of cut sets. So if we have this, we can use things like uh, transfer gates to separate out our data. So you can, you can imagine, you know, overly complex diagrams, very difficult to navigate and jump through. Um, we can use transfer gates to represent them or break them down as, you, as shown here. So I can easily switch back and forth between them. I can also dissolve this or collapse it uh, to go back to my main uh, top level gate. From here, we can also use you know, toolbars to go and add new information to it. So I can add new gates. We can also add in new events. Okay. And then I can populate those with information using the same uh, gate properties, go in, add descriptions, uh, identifiers, and so forth. We can also use uh, graphics, as previously shown, uh, to highlight key branches, make it a bit more uh, distinguishable for other users to highlight that information. Uh, and then we can go through and calculate all that data. Okay. So at any point in time, if you do have branches or you have scenarios that you may want to reuse at any given time, we can add them to our library. So insert this selection, it will populate my library. So now if I go through and browse, we can see that, that that branch itself that I've selected and added uh, can be reused now in uh, future projects or in other diagrams. So the idea is you know, making things a lot easier um, and limiting the amount of time you have to recreate information. Okay. So once we've got all that information in, um, we're happy with it. It's just a matter of clicking calculate to go through uh, and define those values. So we just might want to make sure that we're selecting the appropriate um, FTA. And then from there, we can go through and calculate um, additional fields. We get a nice summary of that information and we can use that for you know, whatever use case that we have. So the other thing to note is when we are creating um, our events and diagrams. So we can uh, firstly create additional events based on that. We can also use repeated events. So if I copy that and paste it. We have repeated events, so essentially recreating or transferring that information from one branch to another um, because they both occur at the same time. 
We can also have scenarios where uh, we might want to data link. So, you know, similar to before, if we want to include data linking, um, then it works same way as RBD, where we can add that in, select on the relevant components, and create that relevant link. We can go one step further and actually take an FTA diagram and we can build it from um, our FMEA. So what I'm going to do is essentially isolate an end effect that I've, uh, I've seen in my reports. And from there, I'm going to build out all the relevant uh, gates and events. So you can see everything is automatically linked together. So all the corresponding um, hierarchy, depending on the gates, uh, the uh, the assemblies as well as that bottom level uh, mode or end effect, should I say. And it's going to pull through information not only from FMEA, but it's also going to pull through information from prediction. So prediction, uh, because I used a system FMEA worksheet, it's pulling through that prediction um, system tree information and failure rates into my FMEA. And then now that I've generated my FTA from my FMEA, it's pulling through that data. So I've used it not only once, but I've used it twice, um, which allows me to uh, go through and really recreate a lot of this information quick and easily. So likewise, I can go through, generate any sort of calculations from this, make sure that I select you know, everything that I'm interested in, and I'll choose the calculator for all gates. Once I'm happy with that, The system will go through, generate that summary slide uh, as we saw previously, and we now have you know all the different uh, values associated with given events and gates. So then we can now go through, um, conduct our analysis. Um, most importantly, you know highlighting our cut sets. So you know which events will actually, uh, which events, if they do occur, lead up to that top level event. Um, so we can easily cycle through. So I'll scroll out a fraction. You can see um, a very light blue, and I can kind of jump through all the different scenarios that will lead up to this top level event occurring. Okay. So, next thing I'll jump to is um, our Fracas incidents. So, essentially, Fracas is working off um, the system tree. So, if I cycle between, you can see that that fracas incidents are getting generated um, depending on where I'm actually um, associating them to. So that's all working off filters, so I can remove those, um, but it makes it easy to cull a large data set. If I introduce a new record, we can see that I can manually input that data, you know, where, where it's happening, what's happening to it. Um, serialized numbers, so if we are having, you know, batches or serialized codes from uh, some sort of system, whether it's, you know, ERP or PLM, uh, we can input that information in there as well as dates um, and so forth. So as mentioned previously, we don't have to generate or we don't have to populate this information using um, our table. We can actually populate it using forms. Um, so these forms make it very easy to identify, well, uh, in sort of that process, what do I need to fill out? So users can easily come in, start inputting that information. And off they go. And if we jump back here, we can see that information gets populated or transferred across. So the other thing to note is we can then escalate that incident. So uh, it's now linked to a problem. And if we jump over, we now have a new problem. So we can likewise, input that, um, generate some of this data to use. And then from there, we can take it and we can escalate it into a problem report kappa. And I'll show you that in my system that's linked to Windshield. Okay. So give me a sec, I'll just jump across. So before I show you, I guess, what is uh, the Windshield interface, I'll give a bit of context to it. So the idea here is that we have one of PTC's data sets being the Polaris snowmobile. Um, so this is an overloaded assembly, which is why we have multiple components overlaid on one another. And over here, uh, I guess the most important thing to take out of this is the engineering form. So you can see 
uh, firstly, distinct containers containing things like, you know, your chassis system. If I expand this out, we can see that information is then um, categorized. So we have, you know, two different types of chassis that I can choose from, um, you know, multiple engines, multiple windshields. So if I jump into icon, into my risk and reliability session, and I open my snowmobile project, we can see that same engineering bomb uh, be duplicated across. So it's gonna have the same components that we we're seeing in windshield. Um, we also have context sensitive menus now being the PTC windshield tab. And from here, we can now check for updates, synchronize items um, and update any records, as well as view information like you know, thumbnails um, and then jump to uh, the parent windshield file uh, within windshield PLM. So this associativity between them allows you to work with the most up-to-date and relevant information. So you're not having to, um, I guess, cross correlate, you know, export out uh, an XML or CSV file, make sure that you're using the correct values or the correct line items, um, iterations and versions. You can just pull down the, I guess, the latest information directly from Windshield and conduct your analysis on that. So looking uh, at, I guess, Windchill itself, we also have, or risk and reliability itself connected to Windchill, we have the problems tab. So previously when I had it disconnected, I wasn't able to uh, then generate my relevant problem reports and change requests. So now having it connected to Windchill, we can now use our problems outlined and defined within risk and reliability to then, um, warrant any sort of problem reporting, change requests, CAPA requests uh, within Windshield PLM. So it's a good way of uh, generating or justifying these, uh, these issues um, and having valid or valid reasoning for them. Um, the last thing to make mention of is when creating new systems, having a connected system, we can run our uh, file creation wizard and we will have a new tab or a new radio button being um, create product directly from Windchill. So you can imagine within my Windchill environment, I'll have um, a series of end items. And the idea is I can pull those structures directly into risk and reliability uh, to analyze just as you've seen previously. 